Let's pray, friends. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Amen. Friends, please rise as we read our gospel lesson for this morning. The text from John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. And let's read that together, starting in verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace, peace, and mercy are yours through he who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. C.S. Lewis is thought of to be probably one of the greatest theologians and apologists for the past century or so. And yet, if it wasn't for the grace of God, sending one particular man into his path, Lewis may never have been either of those things. That one particular man is a great author himself. His name is J.R.R. R. Tolkien. Perhaps you've heard of his name. If you haven't, I'm sure you've probably heard of his body of works. It's the Lord of the Rings. And yet, despite being a, a great storyteller, the greatest gift that Tolkien had was the ability to use his imagination to communicate the message of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus to millions of people all around the world without them ever having realized it. One of those creative gems that we get to look at today has a connection to what brings us here to this celebratory festival service today. In Tolkien's first book ever to make it to the big screen, The Fellowship of the Ring, he introduces a short and damaged man by the name of Bilbo Baggins along with a, a wizarding friend called Gandalf the Grey. The purpose that brings these two men together is the task of gathering a group of people, a fellowship of people, to take a ring that Bilbo possesses to a mountain to destroy it. It's a long story. It's filled with, with action and suspense and drama and even a little bit of romance. But before the story ever gets started, Gandalf sees the dark effect of this ring on his friend, and he offers to carry the weight of it for him. Bilbo, however, agitated, lashes out in a selfish rage, and says stuff that he probably shouldn't have said, and then Gandalf shouts back in return, Bilbo Baggins! Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks! I'm not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. Those same words ring true in the occasion that brought Jesus before Pilate in our reading. It would be foolish to think that Pilate had never heard of Jesus before this moment. No doubt the ruckus that was occurring in Jerusalem and throughout Judea made its way to his praetorium, Pilate's royal palace within Jerusalem. No doubt his own spies reported the agitation of this Nazarene who was gifted with the ability to gather a crowd that he caused this group of Jewish leaders. Even Herod himself viewed Jesus as a, a conjurer of cheap tricks. In fact, he wanted Jesus to perform some for him this very day. Yet neither Pilate nor that Jewish mob were all that entertained or amused. People just saw Jesus as a, as a performer, an entertainer, a fraud, someone who could rouse the crowd.
crowd of his speeches and tricks. No one ever saw him for what he was. A king whose reign is like no other, because his reign is limitless. Now we can't we can't go on without appreciating appreciating the, the irony of this entire situation because God knows Pilate certainly did. The Sanhedrin, this Jewish council, this religious council, not a political council, a religious council sent out their goons, their temple guards, to arrest a man who just days before was declared to be the son of David by many people. A messianic term that God the Lord spoke to David about his descendants, describing his kingdom being an everlasting one, marked with a special anointing, mimicking one that happened years before at the Jordan. This man who was declared to be an everlasting king by the voice of God himself, for many to hear, along with thousands of others attesting to his kingship, was now being kidnapped in the middle of the night, subject to false accusations and coercion, beatings, mockings, ridiculings, and then being retried in the light of day for everyone else to legitimize what they had done to him, and then dragged through the city streets to this Gentile official's home to be condemned and crucified. The charge was nothing other than Jesus being exactly who he was, and a whole heck of a lot more. A king presented to a governor as a criminal being charged with being a king. A king that no one wanted, but a king that was like no other. Pilate certainly appreciated the irony of it. You can see by the questioning that he asked. Are you the king of the Jews? That's what Pilate asked him. The question is, is if you were Jesus, how would you have answered that question? He couldn't say no. It would have been a lie. But it was far too complicated to just say, yeah. In fact, if he did just say yes, it would have given credence to the very charge the Jews were bringing against him. Except there's this one teeny little thing. Pilate didn't care. He had no concern over who was the legitimate king of Israel. Pilate nor Rome had no worries of a legitimate king sitting on the throne of a third world vassal province that was under the authority of Roman rule. And besides, regardless of the thousands of people that Jesus gathered to themselves, the majority of them were either farmers, fishermen, or women and children. The closest people in his, his intimate circle was a ragtag group of men and women who were nowhere near equipped to do battle against the greatest military force at that time. And yet, the Sanhedrin was not about to let it go. They wanted to impress upon Pilate the severity of the threat that Jesus posed. They just had to do it in a way that would make Pilate care. And yet, look at how Jesus responds. He says this, he says, Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about it? Jesus isn't an idiot. He knows exactly why Pilate was bringing that question up. But what he's doing is giving Pilate an opportunity to really let the magnitude of the situation weigh on his mind. And cause him to think, am I really looking for a yes or no answer here? Or is there something more about this guy I've heard so much about? And yet the sad reality of what Pilate says next shows the, the coldness of his heart. Am I a Jew? <laughs> it's almost as if it's almost as if Pilate is, is saying, "Are you trying to imply that, that you are my king too?" But what Pilate remarks 
what's about next puts the nail in the coffin. Your own people, your own chief priests, they handed you over to me. The word there literally says, they betrayed you to me. In other words, what Pilate is saying to him is, are you trying to assert that you're my king? Why would I ever want that? Your own people, your own chief priests, your own subjects brought you to me. And they hate me. So what does that mean about you? Besides, we already know already who, who Pilate's king was. It was Caesar. In the Jewish mob right outside, they weren't hesitant about reminding him of that fact. If you acquit this man, you are no friend of Caesar. But regardless, Pilate concludes with a final question. He says, what is it you have done? What is it that you said, that you taught, that you performed, that you carried out? that makes these very people, the ones whose palm branches and cries about you being a king just days before, now bring you to my court and call for your death. Jesus' answer really addresses all the questions that Pilate has been asking this entire time when he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Christ's kingdom is not about geography. It's about his relational activity. It's not made up of brick and mortar, but living stones, human beings. It's not one that's lost to the sands of time in the chronicles of history, like the empires of Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Greece and soon to be Rome. As the Lord said to his forefather, David, his kingdom is an everlasting one. It's a kingdom that is not divided by walls and barriers. It's not made up of regions and, and a race. It's for all people, for all time, everywhere. For there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Ironically enough, in our world today, with our current leadership, we keep having this message thrown out there all around the world. We're in this together. There's a pandemic. We're in this together. We will conquer this together. We will be victorious together. Our even current leadership says we must be united. We must be united. And at the very onset, there's division everywhere. Togetherness and unity are something that this world cannot offer us. It may be built into the name of our country, but it isn't true. No human agency or system can offer it. And yet, we still put our trust in them. We still swear allegiance to party, plan, and platform. We still hold on to ever so tightly to freedom a nation of current and deceased soldiers fought to provide for us for a time, instead of holding ever so securely onto the freedom that our king died to provide. A freedom that creates and establishes real, lasting unity and peace. We, not, we might not be in the place of Pilate asking the same questions that he did, but we still have the same attitude towards Jesus as he did and as Herod did. We still view Jesus at many times as if he's a conjurer of cheap tricks, just like Gandalf rebuked Bilbo for it, and Herod tried to get Jesus to perform. Except for the fact that Jesus is not a fraud. He's not a performer or an entertainer. He doesn't care if you find enjoyment of being here. He's not our court jester. He's our king. He's a king who knew us before we were ever born. A king who sewed us together in our mother's womb. He's our king who, who numbered the hairs on our head and numbered the days of our lives. He's the king who, who, though he could have sent forth countless legions of his servants,
to relinquish him from Pilate's control instead on a daily basis sends those servants out to minister to us. He's a king who doesn't command us to go into battle to fight for our own lives and save our own souls. But instead offer his very life to set us free from sin and Satan in the world so that we're not afraid of it because he overcame it for each and every one of us. Pilate never saw that. He couldn't see that. Neither could the Jews outside. They didn't see Jesus as a king. They saw him as a criminal. They didn't, they didn't look on Jesus with eyes of faith, with eyes of judgment. And when neither Pilate nor the crowd had legitimate reason to condemn him of death, Jesus' answer only perpetuated Pilate's cynical and skeptic attitude toward him. And his response to Jesus is, Ah, you are a king then. If only that was a cry of faith. If only that was a testimony of belief. Instead of an utterance of sarcasm. Yet regardless of the heart of this man that stood before the king of the world, Jesus was about to display his magnitude before him. Because he's a king like no other. His reign is rooted in truth. Jesus said this. He said, you're right. You're right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this very reason, I was born. For this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Anyone on the side of truth listens to me. You already know if you've ever been at any Lenten service, Pilate's response to that statement. And yet it's not about Pilate. It's not about some Gentile governor. It's not about the Jews that brought him there. And it's not about the title of King of the Jews on a plaque that was hung upon a cross that Jesus was about to go to. It was about him right there, that man. Not King of the Jews, but King of kings and Lord of lords, King of heaven and earth. He says, for this reason I was born. That Greek word there means to forget. Immediately our mind goes to the words of John earlier on in his gospel where he says, God loves the world so much that he gave his one and only begotten son. Beget not in the sense of coming from a place of non-existence to existence, but always existing into a world to testify to the truth. Do not take me for a conjurer of cheap tricks. I'm not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. Those are words spoken out of love and truth from one friend to another who's completely consumed by greed and lust for power. Not just Gandalf to double baggins, but, but in spirit from Jesus to Pilate, Jesus to the Jews, and from Jesus to us. I'm not a conjurer of cheap tricks. I'm not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. God tells us that all earthly authorities are his servants. That are meant to commend the good and punish the wicked. And yet that's very rarely ever the case. And it certainly wasn't the case here. The truth that most leaders only know is the height of their egos, the breadth of their ambitions, and the depth of depravity they're willing to go to fulfill them. But not Jesus. Jesus says he specifically came to testify to the truth. It's the truth that he declares when he says through him and him alone, a pathway to the kingdom of the Father has been made. It's the truth that he caused Peter to declare when he said, Who should we go to? Where can we go? You alone have the words of everlasting life. It's the truth that Jesus beckons us to receive of a pledge of forgiveness carried over to us through waters of baptism where he makes that truth, his truth, ours. 
It's the truth that he says, I am, as well as the life, a life that I've come to give you and give it to the full. Friends, truth is something that no one in this world who is in a position of leadership will ever offer you. No one stands at the political polls and says, I'm going to be honest, 120%. Because they can't. It runs in direct contradiction to the truth of what Jesus stands by and stands on. His reign is in our hearts is the very testimony of truth that we received because of the salvation we heard and he offered. It's also the truth that his spirit that he gave to us reminds us of as we wait for our king to return. How our eyes and our very flesh long for that moment with the confidence of Joel. And while we wait, while we wait, we just get to sit back patiently, hoping, trusting, Singing forth, come King Jesus, come, ride on, ride on in victory, O sacred head now wounded. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding regards our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.